My name is Sylvia Massey. I'm a producer. Welcome to Studio Divine. This is Earthquaker Devices. Show us your junk. I've got junk. I got tons of junk. I got so much junk. Let's just start with this thing right here. This is my Neve 8038. Some people call it an 8028. I think it's an 8038 because that's what's on the blueprints. Uh, it has 1073 EQs. And you really can't fuck it up too bad because they don't give you a whole lot of selection as far as frequencies go. I have great results with this console and have been using it for years. First of all, I found it in CTS in London, which is a film studio where they did all the, uh, the scores for the James Bond movies. So Sir George uh, Martin used this while he was recording those soundtracks. When I bought it, I shipped it over to LA and I had it installed into the studio, uh, the B room at Sound City. And that's where it lived for a long time. Uh, during that time, I would use it on occasion, but a lot of other people used it too. So Sheryl Crow used it uh, with her early hits. Uh, so did the Queens of the Stone Age, um, Black Crows, Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, Lenny Kravitz, Ry Cooter. A lot of people have worked on this console. I'm very, very lucky to have it. I moved it up to Northern California when I had a studio in an old theater in Weed, California, in the Weed Palace Theater. And I got used to using uh, the open room format for recording. So right now I've moved it up to my new home in Ashland, Oregon, and I have it installed in an old church. Also, we're just in the main sanctuary. There is no control room. We all use headphones when we're recording uh, the basic tracks. And it works great. Uh, there's, there's a much comfortable environment for musicians to give me the, the, their best performance here. Right now on the console, I'm set up to do a couple different projects at the same time. I've got uh, mics set up for guitars, bass, and lead vocal. We'll be doing that tonight. And at the same time, on the split console in the monitor section, I have a mix returning here, a hybrid mix that I'm working on in another project. And the way I use it is out of the Pro Tools, I have stems coming out and I bring them up on stereo pairs here. And I'll be able to do this mix quickly here, uh, just putting in an, a stereo bus insert, the GML 8200 EQ and the Loop Trotter uh, limiter, the Emperor limiter that I'll be using here in a minute. Let me show you more about that because that is analog rack gear. More stuff. All right, so here by the console, I'll do as much recording as possible. That means I'll have the guitar and bass player come up here with me next to the console. And I'll even set up the vocal mic right next to the console so there's no glass between me and the singer because I want to have instant communication with them. For tonight's session, I'm using a, a Soyuz SU-017, which is a beautiful Russian-made tube mic. Uh, we will just be right here. Uh, I'll wear headphones. We'll both wear headphones, and we'll communicate directly next to each other. That is my preferred way of working. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool, isn't it? Well, all right. Yeah. Nice job, Molly. <laughs> Yo! Uh, I have a special talkback mic that I always use. If I'm showing you my junk, this is some special junk right here. Look at this. It is silver and gold plated with my name engraved in it. And no one is allowed to touch it except for me. Don't even look at it. So let's see. Oh, we have some things in the rack back here, which I love. This is my favorite vocal chain, and I'll use this as much as possible. 
So luckily I have Neve 1073 modules in the console and I'll put my microphone in that and then out of that on an insert I'll put this UA175 uh, compressor on there. I've got a pair of them. Here's another one. Then I'll go out of that into uh, the Yuri 1176 and then into the recorder, the Pro Tools recorder. Lying beneath your sin, but not legend from sight to not deny. Lying beneath your skin, but not legend from sight to not deny. Lying. One thing I love are analog compressors. But the compression I really love is over here. And this special thing is nicknamed the Army Man because it's got this little plastic Army Man in it. I found this in a garage in Glendale. It was an old radio guy had it in his garage and he sold it to me for cheap because it was basically, you know, an electrical hazard. And it sounds completely broken and I'll never ever fix it because it's fantastic. So for System of a Down, we used it on the guitars and the singer put that little plastic army man in there when he was goofing around. And so it, it just stuck there. That's the army man now and it'll always be the army man and it'll never get fixed because it's broken in just the right way. I also love these loop trotters, they're new and there's a limiter and a compressor. I use the limiter on the stereo bus and the compressor I'll use on drum room. I'll use it on the stereo bus too. It's a great tool, studio tool. The uh, setup that I have for my session tonight is for guitar and bass. I'm using this beautiful white Falcon Gretsch with a splitter box going into both a Rivera and wizard head. The cabs are downstairs, they're isolated with microphones so we don't, we're not blasted out up here. For bass, and I have the bass set up too, we're gonna use that dark glass amp. It's a little thing on top there. It packs a big punch, little thing, big sound. Well, with guitar, I'll drag out a bunch of guitar pedals before we start. And we're starting tonight with some Earthquaker pedals. We've got the Afterneath, which is a really dreamy sound. And in case that doesn't give me the effect I want, I've got the Ghost Echo, which is also a really cool, dreamy sound. The Pitch Bay is another Earthquaker pedal that emulates the sound that you would get like if you were Prince and you were doing a solo and the way he would layer those solos with that harm harmonic kind of sound, that's what you get with the pitch bay. And speaking of Prince, uh, well, I have a chair in the studio here. This, this old chair is the one that I used to have in session when I worked with Prince. On the first day I worked with him, he asked me if I didn't have an old grandma's chair that uh, I could bring in the studio to, so he could sit in it. And the studio had nothing like it. I was working at Larrabee at the time. But I went to the front desk and borrowed a truck uh, went down to an uh, antique store, bought a chair, the first thing I could find, threw it in the back of the truck and brought it back to the session and brought it in. And Prince loved it and he sat in that chair and he would shop, well, he was, he was looking through women's magazines and it turned out he was shopping for models. And that's a whole other story anyway. Okay, what are we gonna look at next? How about more about microphones? We have many mics to show you. All right, now over here, we have some various studio tools. And that includes uh, some weird old mics. I like collecting old mics, if you didn't notice. So here's a few that kind of just uh, found their way to my collection. I'm not even sure where those came from. But I also like to collect telephones. So wherever I go in the world, I usually try to make it to a thrift store or a, an op shop to pick up a few local telephones, like this one. This is an East German phone, which is really cool because it, it was operated with a crank. Uh, and this one is from Prague. When I was doing a record in Prague, I picked this one up and I actually use it, see, I modify 
the handsets so that they can be used as microphones. And uh, this is the first phone that I did that with, and I'll just pull it out here and show you. So this telephone was one my father showed me how to modify so that it can be used as a microphone in the studio. And you'll see I just took an XLR cable, cut the end off of that XLR cable, and I gutted the phone and attached the XLR cable to the little cradle where the carbon button sits. Now, to bring it up to line level, because that's not enough level to, um, to really sound anything kind of good, so what you do is you add a battery across one side of it. And I'll show you where I hide the battery. I hide it in the handset. So I have a, ha a battery I put across one side of that XLR, and then I just hide it up in here. So now it's line level. It comes right out of this XLR cable. Line level. I have singers use these things all the time for effect vocals. And uh, it's, a, it's a really great studio tool. All right, so this is the mic collection. This is where the cool mics are. These are the vintage mics. I love to just have a collection to look at. This is a MD-21, which is an old Sennheiser. And in fact, this is the predecessor to a studio workhorse that everybody knows. I've got one of those here. This is where my workhorse mics are on this side. I've got a bunch of Shures. Audio Technicas, and then the Sennheisers. And this is the MD-421 that w came after the MD-21. And you can see they, they kind of look similar. So I was really excited to find this when I went to Dresden and was looking in an op shop there and found it. I love microphones. I'm writing a book about vintage mics now. I'll have a lot of information about the history of mics. And I really got interested when I was traveling in Europe uh, in the early German mics that came out of a town called Gefell. And I managed to find a bunch of East German tube mics. This is a UM57. This is the early Neumann, because Neumann moved from Berlin to Gefell after the war. I'm going to write a, the entire story about Neumann and Gefell in the book that I'll be finishing this year. Uh, another Gefell mic that I have here is this PM860. I've got a pair of these. And they just look really cool, don't they? They look like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, like you could hurt someone with them, right? actually hurt drummers with these. No, I don't hurt drummers. All right, we have some amps here. These are some of the guitar amps and bass amps that I have here at Studio Divine. Uh, and I wanted to show you some special ones here. This little piggy, you can take it camping with you. It's got batteries in it. But I wind up using this almost every session uh, it just has a great blues tone. It never disappoints. So this one gets used a lot. And I, I don't know a whole lot about the Piggy brand, but <laughs> I love that amp. If you find one, get it. This is a fat head built by the same fellow who, who builds the bullhead amps today. It's a low wattage amp, and it, and it just rips. It's a sweet, sweet amp. Uh, and the bull heads today are basically the same design. Um, let's see, what else do we have? This one, all right. Now, you wouldn't think this was a really good studio tool, but in fact, I use this to get feedback when I'm working with a guitar player because what I'll do is I'll use a splitter pedal, and uh, one of the splits will go to a, a big amp, and then the other split will go to this little one, and I'll crank it, and then I'll push it right into the guitar player's uh, guitar and to get squealing effects. And so I do a lot of this with that. So it's always good to have a little first act around. Uh, this Dan Electro is a beauty. The crank. These little guys. Oh, it's a fucking heavy. 
This is a ZT, I call it a ZT because my friend Thomas turned me on to these and he's a, a Brit. And when we did the goddamn record with him, uh, we used the ZTs on that and we used it a lot. It's heavy, it's loud, and it sounds great. This little thing is quite unusual. It's a guitar amp. It has a tremolo in it and I keep it around mainly for a table while I'm using other amps. All right. So this SVT came to me through a friend, Josh Gordon. I was working with his band. He brought it into the session. It was a wreck. It didn't have any Tolex on it. The front cover was gone. When you flipped it on, it sounded like a jet taking off because the fan was so noisy. And you'd plug into it, and it would sound good for about maybe 10 minutes, but then it would shock you. Uh, so bass players, it was very dangerous. So I stopped using it for years, but I had it in a closet in the back room. Uh, pulled it out for a session one day when my other SVT wasn't working, and I was working on a band called Dishwalla, and the bass player, Scott, plugged in, got shocked, and luckily didn't get hurt, but he looked at it and he says, you know, I can fix this. And I says, well, Scott, you can have it, because I wasn't using it anymore. But two years later, he brought it back to me. He says, look, I can't, have this amp you need to have it back because he did some research on it it has no s serial number on it and he suspected it was one of the first prototypes that went out on tour with the stones in 1969 one of six that was used for both guitar and bass so if that's the case then this is a very historic amp i always use both di and an amp when i track bass i try not to use plug-in processing to create a good amp sound, especially when I've got something like this around. All right, let's go look at some more junk. All right, now we are in the equipment room, and here's where we store drums and guitars and guitar pedals and other wonderful things. Uh, you'll see I've got a supply of hoses here because I use hoses when I record drums. I actually put a mic in one end of the hose and wrap this around the base of a drum kit. And it filters out the high frequency cymbals, which are so obnoxious. Those damn drummers and their cymbals. Uh, also, let's see, I got some, I've got a couple things here. This mic is an interesting microphone. This has a story behind it. This is an AKG C1000 and you can see it has been beat to shit, and that's because this was the mic that we used in Undertow um, that with Tool. We were at first using a suspended, expensive Neumann microphone, but it became obvious that Maynard needs to have a handheld mic to get the performance where he's like, raw. So this is what we used. It's a C1000, it's a condenser with a battery in it, it's got good high frequency uh, reproduction, but it's nothing really fancy, you know? Another good mic that would be great for handheld, obviously, is an uh, SM58. But this was the one that we used for undertow. This is a vintage Telefunken U47. And this one uh, was the one that I used with Johnny Cash when I worked with Rick Rubin on Johnny Cash's Unchained. And that was a very special session because it had um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers as the backup band. And there were a lot of great guest artists, Lindsey Buckingham, Marty Stewart, uh, Carl Perkins. So the, there's a lot of DNA in there from some some great musicians. But let's talk about some snares for a minute since I'm showing you my junk. My favorite snare of the collection is this Ludwig 70s Black Beauty. It seems to always work. Another great one is this Longo, this um, solid shell walnut uh, wood drum. Fantastic snare. I, I really like this Spawn too and this vintage Ludwig. But that Black Beauty always wins. Let's see, over on this side, we have some guitars. 
and bases. This particular base used to belong to John Doe from the band X, which is an LA band. And uh, you can see some video of him playing this bass. Uh, and and it, it's really has a very particular sound. It sounds very tubby, like the trogs uh, or the turtles. And it has flat wound strings on it, the same strings that were on it when I bought it. So we could just keep it like that. It sounds a bit like a stand-up acoustic bass. This has a story. This isn't a particularly special guitar, but uh, when I worked with Prince, I had this in the session. I had just bought it at Guitar Center for $200. It's a Fender Gemini 2. Well, it turns out Prince is a Gemini, so Im immediately he was drawn to this guitar. And he used it on the, the album Diamonds and Pearls. On, uh, it was the only acoustic on the record, actually. He loved this guitar so much that he tried to pack it in his stuff when he was packing up to leave at the end of the session. And uh, I noticed that he was packing it in his road cases, or he told his guys to pack it away. And I said, hey, that's my guitar. And he says, no, no, I want that guitar. And I said, well, I could go down to Guitar Center and buy you one for $200. He says, no, I want that one. But I, I kept it. I didn't want him to take it. So, uh, so I still have it. So that's the Prince guitar. What else do I have here? Oh, this is something that I use almost on every drum tracking. It's an old cassette recorder, and you can find these in thrift stores easily. The ones you want to look for are the ones that have the built-in mic. When I set this up on a session, I'll take an output and have it go to a track, to, to a mic pre, and record it in front of the drum kit. The thing about these old cassette recorders is they have built-in compressors that are really aggressive because it's meant to be recording in the back of a room and catch all the conversation in the room or whatever you're recording. So, uh, so when you use it for drum recording, well, it's going to get everything and it gives it a nice pumping sound and it's really exciting. So I always set this out. It's one of my secret weapons. Okay, we have a lot of pedals. We've got the gasoline, we've got some uh, Zvex pedals, we've got, you know, boss pedals, okay. But the Earthquaker devices are the funnest pedals and the easiest to use, I think. I wanna demonstrate a few of my favorites. And to do that, I'm gonna use this uh, Soma Lyra 8 synthesizer. And this is a crazy thing that this Russian mad scientist built. It's, uh, it uses touch sensitive pads to uh, engage the uh, oscillators. And there's eight oscillators. You can change the pitch on each and the modulation on each. So I've got those running through three different pedals and I'll show you what these pedals do. But first let's get a load of this crazy synthesizer and what it does on its own. All right, so you get the idea of what this thing does. Well, now I'm gonna engage this Acapulco Gold, and this is an Earthquaker Devices pedal that I love so much, it, it just has one big knob on it. Well, you, you know, it does one thing really well, and it's in a super overdrive. All right, that's super obnoxious, but also awesome. Next, I want to show you what the spatial delivery does. And the thing that's great about this, it does one thing really well, and that is it's an envelope filter that will open and close. And you'll see what it does now. So 
you can hear what that's doing. Spatial delivery, awesome. Now this is the arpenoid, and this is an arpeggiator. This is one of my favorites, and you'll see why. Hours and hours of fun. So that's why we love these pedals. They do one thing and they do it simply and really well. So it's not like a, a, a multi uh, function thing that has all these, you know, really super complicated things going on. No, no. You want an envelope filter, there it is. You want an arpeggiator, there it is. And you want some nice overdrive right there. And that's why we love the Earthquaker devices. So I'm talking about my junk. I got lots of junk. Here's some more junk. Let's look at the new mix system. This is the temporary home of the new mix room. Uh, and you can see I've got Genelec 8351A monitors. These are great and they'll travel with me into the new room because uh, they adapt to any new space. I just do a sweep and they, they adapt. Uh, I'm also really excited about the Slate. I've got a Raven and I'm using the Slate mic. Uh, you'll see it here. The, uh, the, the mic is a, it's an analog mic, but you change the sound with digital modeling. And so you, it's like having a whole closet full of vintage mics, vintage uh, uh, German mics. It's fantastic. The best part about this new room is the dangerous music system and then something that they've created called a liaison. And this is the liaison here. The liaison is a passage for the analog EQ and compressor to go into that digital circuit. This is the best thing ever because now I get that analog uh, finishing on my mix. And to, to top it off, I have this thing right here, a pair of Western Electric 111C transformers. They are the sound of iron. Uh, we call it the Iron Giant. This I put across the last stage of my analog circuitry on my mix bus. And the liaison will let you just plug it right into the front here. So now I can add that into my mix on the final thing before it goes back into the Pro Tool system. So if I'm mixing in the box, this is now how I'm going to be using this system. But as well, I wanted to have some really good high-end and interesting uh, choices for recording in the new studio because I will be doing overdubs. I'll probably try to do some drum recording, but mostly overdubs and vocals. Well, so I've got some possibilities for that. Here I've got this WEM console. This was, uh, it belonged to Alvin Lee. It went on tour uh, with Alvin Lee and 10 years after. So there's some, some good um, DNA in there. And then this lovely RCA broadcast console. This is straight out of a radio station. And I can use this to get some really cool vocal effects. If I want that old timey radio sound, I've got it right there. I might even do my own radio show, who knows? I spend a lot of time doing adventure recording and adventure recording is to me like working and recording and in unusual places. It's difficult to do if there's not recording equipment there, or especially if there's not power. You can bring in a laptop with a, an interface, but if you don't have, you know, shore power, you're gonna have some problems. But that's why these days I bring this guy with me. So this is the Sound Devices Mix Pre 10M. And the crazy good thing about this is it battery powered and it has eight mic pre's in it. It's self-contained. 
you can see there's tracks. It, it's multi-track recorder. You can record, I think you can record 10 at the same time. So, and you can also connect this with another one. So you can have 16 mic pre's. Imagine carrying this anywhere. So recently I took this guy into an art museum and recorded a punk rock band in an art museum, like a kind of a flash kind of thing where we, they didn't know what the heck we were doing because I just had this under my coat. So they didn't even know until it was too late. Uh, we didn't get kicked out, but they shushed us along. Uh, I've also taken this guy into the Aldwych tube station in the London Underground and set up and recorded a band on the platform. It's an abandoned uh, subway platform uh, in the London Underground with a, like a ghost train down there. It's really down deep and there's no power, but I carry this with me. It's a great, great thing, sound devices. So, adventure recording. Everybody should be doing it. So this is my bag of tricks. And I carry this to sessions with me because uh, there's things that I need in sessions that studios don't have. And I can take this anywhere, like uh, broken guitar parts. These make interesting microphones. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Light bulbs make really interesting filters for audio. And the way I do that is by taking an old speaker cable and cutting it in so that I have an extension cord in the speaker cable. So this is between an amp and a speaker. It is diverted into uh, an extension cable. Then I plug in the light. Now the audio is going through the light bulb on the way to the speaker. And you'll be surprised at the effect that you're going to get because the light bulb will light up and as well as you'll get this filtering effect. Different light bulbs sound completely different from each other too. I especially like fluorescent bulbs. Um, you never know when you're going to need some magnums. I use these in the studio. Uh, not, not for what you might think, but they make great covers for microphones if you're going to put the microphones under water. So I keep those in my bag. And here, this is a surface transducer. Uh, this is the type of thing that I'll put on the surface of a guitar. And it's, it's basically a speaker that doesn't have a cone. So the coil will move if you put sound if you put audio into these connectors. And then you vibrate the body of the guitar and you'll get incredible sustain if you're running the audio from the guitar back into this surface transducer and vibrating the guitar surface with it. Okay, now we're in the shop and I wanted to talk more about the speaker cable being used to divert signal, audio signal, so that you can use filters, like the light bulb, or you can use a drill. And uh, so the way you do it is you connect one end of the speaker cable to the bridge mode on the back of a really powerful solid state amp, like this one. And then plug the other side into a speaker. You can then plug in your appliances or your lights. Now you can also make a cable that is just cut so that you can insert other things into the, the uh, speaker cable. And I will do that with potatoes or hot dogs. Cheese is always really good. In fact, cheese has an amazing blues tone for real. But uh, for a real light show, you can plug in a salty dill pickle and it will light up. So you're running audio through it and it lights up like a light bulb. Now I don't have this speaker set up in my shop right now, but I do have a Variac back here and we can demonstrate how it works with the pickle right here on the bench. All right, here's our Variac. We have this cable, which represents the speaker cable coming out of that powerful uh, solid state amp. Now, before I do anything, nothing is plugged in. I'm going to wear gloves because safety first. All right.
And I have a jar of very salty dill pickles. And I'm gonna pick a nice one here. Mmm, there's a good one. All right. Put that in my ceramic dish. Now I'm gonna take these posts and I'm going to impale the pickle. Right here. And right there, all right? Okay. All right, we're ready for power. Now, my Variac, the power is all the way down, and I'm gonna increase the power until we get enough juice going through that pickle that it will light up. You ready? Here we go. You can see the volts. All right. 120. You can start hearing the pickle. Now you can imagine audio going through that and the audio will do the same thing. It lights it right up. I did the same thing with the Melvins not too long ago. It sure makes a stink though, but, uh, but the audio is crazy sounding. Now remember, if you're gonna do anything like this, be very careful. Unplug before you touch anything. All right, now the last thing I'd like to say about all this is Earthquaker needs to make a pickle pedal.